You're someone with a vision for your practice, for your side hustle, and for your personal journey. But when it comes to establishing your path on how to get to where you want to be with your practice, things get a little messy. You're also someone who'd prefer to go in person instead of to groups and listening to everyone else's story. To me, it sounds like you could benefit from one-on-one consulting with our experienced practice of the practice consultants. From $5.95 a month and up, you can work with a consultant that will give you more direction and practical tried and tested tips matched to you and your goals. For more information, visit practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. Again, that's practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. Hello, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Andrew Burdett, and I'm one of the consultants with the Practice of the Practice. I own a small hybrid group practice based out of Asheville, North Carolina, and we provide some in-person and mostly telehealth across the state of North Carolina and to some additional states as well. I really enjoy helping practice owners set up and manage a set of systems that work well for them, both in efficiency and cost effectiveness. I also really like to help find ways to maximize how they currently work so that they can spend more time engaging what they love to do outside of therapy and the therapy process. You can schedule a pre-consulting call with me at practiceofthepractice.com slash apply and I look forward to meeting with you sometime soon. Hello and thanks for joining us again on the Practice of the Practice podcast. This is episode 926. Um, We are discussing what it's like to be a clinical director in group practice. My name is Andrew Burdett. I'm the solo practice consultant for Practice of the Practice and kind of filling in for Joe Sanok for a couple episodes and talking to a couple of friends of mine that do a variety of different things. Today, I'm joined by my friend, Ali Ramirez, who's the clinical director at Higgins Wellness. And Ali, why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of your career history and kind of what led you up to ending up in a group practice in the first place and then eventually becoming the clinical director over there? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having me, Andrew. I'm really appreciative to be able to chat with you about this. Yeah, so I started out in mental health about 10 years ago. I was doing an internship at a psychiatric residential treatment facility for kids. Um, I applied to grad school while I was doing that internship uh, and was able to get in and got into the clinical mental health counseling program uh, here in our area. I was also uh, sort of looking for other opportunities at that time, um, moving away from residential and ended up in in a a sort of community treatment team doing some administrative stuff for them. I also then moved up eventually to a clinical role um, with the assertive community treatment team um, and then transitioned into outpatient therapy eventually uh, at a similar community mental health agency um, doing like walk-in assessments, group therapy, individual therapy, things like that. Uh, so kind of dipped my toes in lots of places, mostly higher acuity levels of care, and got to a point where I was wanting to really be able to do more therapy and more in-depth work. Uh, so right before COVID, actually, um, I joined Higgins Wellness, the current group practice that I'm at. Are you able to talk a little bit about setting so some of the setting differences between leaving the higher acuity thing versus transitioning into just doing outpatient because they're very different levels of care? And mm-hmm. what was that adjustment coming from that type of agency setting and work into a group practice like? Yeah, I mean, it definitely, I think, was sort of a stepping stone for me from, you know, assertive community treatment and residential to outpatient community mental health. That sort of was the first of those leaps that I made. Uh, It it was, I think, a good thing for just my mental health and my, like, ability to do this work long term to step away from those more higher acuity levels of care. And I think I really got a good sense of what I imagined private practice would be like doing outpatient because I was doing assessments, I was doing individual therapy, but it was still in a community mental health setting. So I think it, it, there were still certain challenges with patient retention and, you know, patients coming in who maybe were uh, actively using substances right before their sessions or things like that. So obviously making that transition to private practice allowed me to work with 
a lot of different types of clients, but but also clients who could do more deep therapy work and, and really dig into issues as opposed to sort of just maintaining a, some semblance of stability. I feel like that that's one of the bigger changes I've noticed in my kind of day-to-day work with clients is how much deeper we can go, how much more we can talk about uh, in a private practice setting as opposed to more the more higher levels of acuity. Got it. You mentioned um, transitioning over to outpatient private practice in 2019. And I'm curious how much time you had before the pandemic came in and then changed how all of us worked. And so how did that transition go in your group practice? Yeah. So I joined the group practice. I was the first person to be hired on to the group in November of 2019. Uh, So we had, gosh, maybe like four or five months of some semblance of normalcy before COVID really started ramping up like February, March, obviously of 2020. It was a challenge, like figuring out how to switch an entire practice from all in-person office-based to solo telehealth or exclusively telehealth. I think that, yeah, everyone was just sort of figuring it out as we went along. Um, At that point, I think there were three clinicians, including myself and the group practice owner, in early 2020. And so a lot of it was just navigating how to do telehealth and how to support our clinicians with that. I think everybody had sort of a, a, a fall off of clients, some clients that didn't want to do telehealth. And, you know, really nobody knew how long we were going to be out of the office for at the time. But I think we we were able to figure it out um, pretty easily, especially using our electronic health record that really allowed us to make that transition much smoother, uh, being able to use the telehealth features. It sounds like with you being the first hire to a solo practice and kind of establishing it as a group that you were kind of in at the ground level. And Mm -hmm. I'm curious also as a group owner and and having the kind of you build the plane as you're flying kind of approach to things is what I've done with um, Justine in my practice too. Um, She's been really crucial in terms of helping figure out systems that work for more than just one person and workflows and things that, Mm -hmm. that make sense. Because if you come in at that ground level, especially as an owner, you kind of have one lens of things. And then if you're coming in as a practitioner in a in someone else's place, you kind of collaborate with them to help develop things. And so how did coming in and helping to set and start the group practice in motion lead to where you are now as one of the pivotal leadership role? Yeah, I mean, the group practice owner and I sort of from the beginning had this vision of, of creating a group practice that would be like an alternative to community mental health for like new and experienced therapists um, who sort of wanted that freedom of private practice without the business side of things. So that was sort of always something we thought about in terms of growing the practice. And then also with me being the first person to be hired on, I feel like I was sort of naturally drawn towards a leadership role, helping, you know, new hires with learning about various things, organizing social gatherings for the team, things like that. Uh, So it sort of made sense that as we continue to grow, there was kind of ongoing conversation about, well, what is it going to look like to have someone in sort of a practice manager, clinical director type role? What does it make sense for me to step into that role? You know, that sort of thing. And growing, since it sounds like you all were having that conversation, and one of the things for listeners out there, I want to note, um, a lot of the group practice owners around here in Asheville have had this perspective of recognizing the dysfunction and and how unhealthy working in agency and community mental health settings are, and are seeing the group practice model as a way to kind of bridge that gap and support people that are not necessarily inclined to run a business themselves or... Mm -hmm serve populations that need a wider range of clinicians and clinical support. Um, I know Higgins has added in prescribing, among other things, so some medication yep. management comes into play. And if you're just in solo practice, working with that extra collaboration doesn't really fit in because it's just you. So it's been really cool talking to 
you and quite a few other people here in Asheville of just trying to change the paradigm and model on how we work and make it accessible in a way that serves both the clinical side of things as well as the clients. Yeah, I agree. I think that there there tends to be in the like therapy and mental health world this idea that you sort of have to like cut your teeth doing community mental health or something similar once you get out of grad school. And you know, obviously I had that experience and I think it was really beneficial, but I don't know that everyone has to go that route necessarily. I do think in particular in the Asheville area that we have a really great community of solo practitioners and group practices that are very, from my experience, willing and, and um, happy to help people who, you know, want to consider other ways of doing things and not go through that sort of traditional community mental health stepping stone process. So, yeah. So as the group grew, when did, when did looking at adding in leadership roles outside of um, Natalie, the owner kind of come into play? And when did that discussion start? Was there like a certain mm-hmm. number of clinicians that kind of really indicated that there needed to be some more explicit management or was, were other things afoot? How did that all come about? Yeah. I mean, it was kind of a, a, a mix of different things that we noticed happening. Um, I feel like in probably like mid to late 2022, you know, we had hired on at least 10 or 12 clinicians. And then we had our doctor of Chinese medicine and our prescribers that we were looking to have join. Um, So it did get to a point where it was, yeah, like sort of a big undertaking for just one person to be managing all of those people. We also had hired some provisionally licensed clinicians who hadn't had experience in an outpatient setting at all prior and needed some additional training and supervision. The practice was getting so many referrals. Um, we do we did have like sort of an administrative assistant type person that was helping with some of those things, but they were getting overwhelmed with the number of referrals coming in. And Natalie was, uh, the group practice owner was sort of managing everything clinical and, and administrative by herself other than with that admin person. And she wanted to be able to sort of delegate a lot of the tasks that she was doing so that she could focus on managing and growing the business as a whole. So I think there was a lot to consider in terms of, okay, what what would this clinical director position include? And in what ways could the practice sort of be helped as a whole by having this role come in? So it sounds like you all grew fairly fast. That yeah. sounds like a pretty big expansion pretty quickly. And mm-hmm. it, it looks like you all did that successfully because you all are still roughly about that size from what I know about y'all. And um, yeah, if you just have someone handling the basic scheduling kind of side of things, that's not the same as having someone be the practice manager from like a real yeah. administrative side of things. It doesn't, mm-hmm. um, there's only so much clinical support you can kind of provide people and you, you know, new people in the field take some attention. And so um, obviously there's clinical supervision that goes with that, but Mm -hmm. there's other things too about just, well, how do I bill a client? Or I get that each practice kind of handles billing and those types of things and client interactions. Some of that's more on clinicians than others, depending on the setting and practice and stuff like that and how the group's structured. But there are a lot of those kind of things that we just don't simply get in grad school and then the actual kind of, you know, to to um, use the eponymous um, practice of the practice after school kind of thing. Like that's kind of what this whole thing's about. And in that clinical director role, how are you supporting the associate level people or how are you addressing their needs that, and for listeners, I want to clarify, like there's clinical supervision, which is directly involved with the licensure process. And then there's, uh, or sorry, clinical supervision there. And then there's clinical direction, which is, overlaps a lot of that. So there's definitely a fair amount of like mentorship to new people and just ability mm-hmm. to consult, but it's administrative. It's not necessarily licensure related, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. I mean, I do have some um, folks on the team who are new clinicians that I am doing license, licensure supervision with. And then I also have folks that I 
they they have outside licensure supervisors and then I'm sort of just supervising kind of like you're saying the systems and the administrative side of things. A lot of that looks like regular team meetings. Um, I would like to be meeting with people uh, more regularly, but right now we have like a monthly all staff meeting essentially. We also have a monthly consultation for um, fully licensed clinicians just to be able to talk about cases and different things that are coming up. And then we have like a um, supervision group for the people that are provisionally licensed. Similar sort of thing, talking about cases, but also talking about administrative things that might be coming up for them, like note template issues or billing issues or insurance things that they encounter. Or you know, one one topic of conversation recently was about like clients canceling sessions repeatedly and how to address that pattern of, of behavior and how it relates to, you know, the therapeutic relationship as well. So a lot of it is um, sort of FaceTime with all of the different clinicians. And uh, then also uh, I'm of course available for questions and uh, anything that they need help with sort of day to day as well. So it sounds like a lot of the administrative lens is in support of the clinical work. So it's less about, um, you know, are we using this system for our payroll and this system for our like EHR? It's more about is the EHR meeting our clinical needs in terms of efficient note taking and documenting and handling the kind of things that wrap around the actual service itself? Yeah, I mean, some of those more administrative systems things the practice owner still handles because she has sort of ultimate final say on how we do things and and in what ways. But a lot of the like introduction to our systems with onboarding and training is, is stuff that I would handle for new clinicians. Mm -hmm. Got it. As a therapist, I can tell you from experience that having the right EHR is an absolute lifeline. I recommend using Therapy Notes. They make billing, scheduling, note taking, telehealth, and e prescribe incredibly easy. Best of all, they offer live telephone support that's available seven days a week. You don't have to take my word for it. Do your own research and see for yourself. Therapy Notes is the number one highest rated EHR system available today with a 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot.com and on Google. All you have to do is click the link below or type promo code Joe on their website over at TherapyNotes.com and receive a special two-month trial absolutely free. Again, that's TherapyNotes.com and use promo code Joe on the website. If you're coming from another EHR, Therapy Notes will also import your demographic data quick and easy at no cost, so you can get started right away. Trust me, don't waste any more of your time and try Therapy Notes. Just use promo code Joe at checkout. Probably touched on some of this, but in terms of just big indicators about creating a leadership team and you kind of becoming a part of that, um, I guess the biggest indicators that kind of led into that and and how you kind of stepped up to kind of present here's some needs and here's how I can bring value to things. And can you speak a little bit to that in terms of helping maybe if someone's out there that works in a group practice that doesn't have a clinical director or that kind of clinical leadership team, like how would somebody present that to their group practice owner, um, at least for consideration? Yeah. So, you know, like I was saying before, I sort of naturally noticed myself being drawn into this leadership role because I was the first person to be hired on and and because a lot of the other clinicians that came on afterwards seemed to look to me for questions and different things. And because this was something that uh, Natalie and I had been talking about, there came a time where I felt like, okay, I've, I'm stable with my client caseload and I feel like I'm ready for something else. I also potentially want to raise and pay a little bit. So I, uh, at the kind of um, three-year mark of me being with the practice, so November of 2022, sort of started having these conversations with Natalie about like, what's the timeline for me possibly stepping into a leadership role? I actually like um, sort of created this whole uh, presentation 
that to talk about like my value to the company and things that I was already helping with, plus a, like additional administrative and clinical duties that I could take on if I uh, was promoted to a leadership role. So I just sort of had a meeting with her and kind of shared all of that information um, and proposed the idea of uh, you know me being promoted into that clinical director role. And I think it obviously it went well. So. <laughs> I had, you know, I, I was, I, I was awarded the promotion, uh, which is very exciting. So, yeah. Um, one of the, one of the things that seems to be an ongoing discussion among group practice owners is how to like afford different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some of those things are like just your basic logistical systems and, you know, office space and software and those kind of things. And then some of the other factors with that are things such as here's billable hours. So obviously you have clinicians seeing clients like that brings in revenue and then that gets divvied up between the practice and then the clinicians. And then when you look at any non-billable hours that, you know, that's kind of a a below the line expense, I think is what we used to call it years ago in a previous career of mine. Um, You're kind of just an expense. You're just kind of extra labor and other things like that. So you don't have to provide super big details or anything, but roughly how, you know, are you still seeing clients? Are you doing, you know, some client work still with a caseload and some as clinical director and kind of splitting time between the two? And is there any discussion about down the road, possibly having that transition into something to where you'll be full-time just clinical director only without having to have a caseload? Is that something that has been talked about? Yeah. So I do still have a smaller caseload of clients. I was seeing around like 23 to 25 clients a week right now in my current role. It kind of ebbs and flows, but typically I want to be averaging around 15 clients a week and then 15 to 20 administrative hours a week. So right around 30 hours total for this role. Of course, you know, that we're on the roller coaster of private practice, and sometimes I see 12 clients a week, sometimes I see 18. So it really just sort of varies depending on my clients and their schedules and all of that stuff. So I think to a certain extent, that still allows me to bring in some income for the practice and not just be an expense without any offset of cost for that. But I'm not obviously bringing in the, the amount of money that I was bringing in previously. So I don't know at this point if there if there would be a time where I'd only be doing clinical and administrative stuff. I think we'd probably have to have a few more clinicians join the team for that to happen. And honestly, I, I really love my client work. Um, it's something that brings me a lot of joy and meaning and purpose. And I don't know that I would ever want to not have a caseload, but certainly I could see it being a little smaller at some point in the future. Mm-hmm. Got it. You've kind of touched on this a bit, but if you had to just summarize like your non-clinical responsibilities that come with the role of being clinical director, how would you kind of sum those up in a nutshell? Yeah. So I co-facilitate the team meetings, the monthly team meetings that I mentioned with Natalie, the practice owner. Um, I run monthly supervision and consultation groups for the clinicians. I um, supervise provisionally licensed clinicians as well. Right now, I'm handling most of the incoming referrals that then get sent to the various clinicians in the practice, including the prescriber and the doctor of Chinese medicine. I organize and schedule social and team building gatherings and different like fun activities that we do, like our Christmas party or, you know, like quarterly outings, things like that. Really kind of anything that sort of day to day needs to happen. I I have helped like with onboarding, like I said, new clinicians, figuring out sort of how to share office space because we have about, you know, 14, 15 people that we're sharing office space and only seven offices. So we have to kind of divvy that. I'm trying to think of what else. (laughs) There's, there's a lot for sure. I, oh, I also like check um, KPIs for our clinicians as well. So like productivity with, you know, sort of monthly averages of how many clients they're scheduling and seeing. Uh, I I stay on top of like billing and, and um, balances and credits and help our biller with making sure that that is all taken care of. So really it's like any kind of nitty gritty stuff 
day to day is, is different things I'm helping with or, you know, different cookie jars I have my hands in. So, yeah. Got it. It does sound like a lot of the emphasis is around the clinical work itself, but there's definitely mm-hmm. some other practice management type mm-hmm. aspects of that with the billing and um, KPIs and things like that. And although things like KPIs and retention rates and number of sessions a client's going to stick around in, um, curious because it's definitely been a discussion among a lot of different group owners and solo practice mm-hmm. people I've talked to lately. What do you all consider as your retention? Like when's a client considered to be retained? Hmm. That's a good question. I feel like if you asked each clinician on our team, they may have a different answer. I don't know that we necessarily have like a standard number of sessions that the, we we as the practice would say, okay, that client is retained. I would I would say probably if someone is come in for, you know, six to eight sessions, that feels for me like, oh, this person's going to stick around. Got it. What do you most enjoy about being in that leadership role? Oh, man, a lot of things. I, I really enjoy seeing the team function well together and seeing like flow states happening with people where like they're sort of do, feeling good about all the aspects of their role and feeling good about the clients they're seeing. And I, I really enjoy seeing people providing really good clinical care. I, I really like to celebrate with the team, like wins that each person has or seeing people kind of celebrate each other. That's really cool. And yeah, being part of like sort of creating a work environment that is healthy and promotes good work-life balance, you know, where people feel appreciated. Again, you know, comparing to the experience of community mental health that so many of us have had, I think feeling a sense of belonging on a team is really important. And and I appreciate seeing that with our folks as well. You know, I I think we all sort of feel a sense of accomplishment when somebody schedules a new intake or, you know, um, somebody fills up their caseload or things like that. So, and then networking with like the bigger Asheville therapy community as a whole and being sort of a representative of my practice within the community is something I really enjoy too. What about this role is the most challenging? Oh gosh. Well, I mean, I think leadership is new to me. I, I, this is sort of my first official like leadership role that I've had in my career. Um, And I think one of the challenges that I'm finding is, yeah, like dealing with some interpersonal things that come up with staff on the team noticing that, you know, sort of everyone naturally has a different way of learning and interacting with others and not everyone's going to do their work in the same way that I would necessarily. So like learning to be patient and adjust expectations around like different performance levels and different work ethics has been interesting and challenging. But I think it's also helped me recognize that like I could improve my own work-life boundaries as well. So in this role, are there any areas where you've kind of really noticed like, hey, there's a lot of room to grow into in this area and develop myself and my skills? Um, and if so, as you've kind of recognized those, are there any good trainings you can point anyone toward to kind of help you grow into those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that my areas of growth that I notice have to do a lot with like managing people. And, you know, again, managing staff who maybe have different approaches to work than I do. You know, I, I want to be able to understand, like, how to navigate the complexities of uh, leadership, especially through, like, a decolonization lens. That's really important to me. I don't want to perpetuate harmful leadership practices in any way. And what I have found to be helpful as far as training so far um, are actually the CEUs that I've done uh, to be a qualified supervisor to like to be able to supervise um, provisional licensed folks. A lot of those have been through like simple practice or uh, quantum CE or one of those online resources. And I've learned a lot about like recognizing power dynamics within uh, supervisor supervisee relationships or um, like how to help your supervisees find their own unique approach to doing therapy I think all of that has been really helpful. And I'm, I'm certainly always looking for more training opportunities as well. 
for listeners out there, um, the counseling field and certainly in North Carolina requires something like 45 hours of specific to clinical supervision training to become a clinical supervisor. And we have this kind of in-between credential called a qualified supervisor that was supposed to be eliminated, but uh, 15 years later, um, I think it's still going on. Um, so if to the listeners out there, whether you run a group practice, whether you have a clinical director, whether you are a clinical director, another thing, I would really encourage you to do seek out a, a counseling oriented clinical supervision thing because I took one earlier this year. I found it incredibly helpful to just think mm-hmm. about being the role of group owner and clinical director and the other gazillion hats that I'm still wearing at the moment in my own practice. But it just it became very helpful in differentiating what's an administrative when I'm the employer side of things from that level of supervision and lens versus what's a clinical thing to where it really helps mentor and and develop clinical skills in others as well as just protect the public. Absolutely. Yeah. In your roughly a year of leading people, what have you what's you what have you learned from your team? Yeah. I mean I think the biggest thing is just noticing that like different ways of approaching work and different work life balance sort of doesn't have to be a bad thing. I think that having people on the team who do things differently means that we can sort of fill gaps better, actually. Different approaches, I think, are complementary. They don't necessarily have to be in conflict. I, I also feel like I've learned and continue to learn to explain things very clearly and directly and to reiterate things multiple times and explain things in different ways if I want to be understood. So I think really it's it's been a growing opportunity for me in understanding how to relate more to people who have a various approaches to how they show up for work. For other group practices out there, mm-hmm. um, do you have any insight or information or perspective to share about when they might start seriously considering having a clinical leadership team and starting that process of developing it? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, there doesn't have to be a set number of like, oh, these are how many clinicians you've hired to feel like you need to consider having a clinical director or practice manager. I think really it's about like how it's feeling for each individual group practice owner in terms of how much they're wanting to continue to put in versus how much maybe they want to delegate. I think, you know, when considering someone um, to take on a a clinical director type role or a practice manager type role, I think it's really important to make sure that you know and trust the person very well, that you're open to feedback from this person as well as giving feedback to that person. Um, I think the relationship between group practice owner and clinical director is very complex and very important. You know, both need the other to function. And I think the boundaries within that relationship should be crystal clear. I think that's obviously very important. And I think understanding, you know, your own leadership style as group practice owner and how you want a clinical director or practice manager to lead your team is really important. And that, yeah, don't forget to appreciate this person because they'll probably be working really hard for you. So, Really appreciate you coming on. Just kind of as we're wrapping up, are there any any things that we didn't talk about that you want to make sure that people take away from this or just in summary of kind of what we've talked about, what would be kind of the, the big takeaways to anybody listening to this podcast about evaluating having a clinical director in a group practice or developing that role or kind of anything else related to that? Hmm. I think m- making sure that, again, the communication between yourself and and whoever you bring on to this role is really important and having like ongoing regular m- meetings, even if it's like weekly possibly is important because so much can happen day to day and so much can change day to day in like the running of a practice. So I think having that like open communication is super important. And, I, you know, I think a lot of people may want to promote from within for a position like this, you know, someone who maybe is already a therapist at at your practice or, you know, already sort of knows kind of how things run and how things operate. And uh, I think that that's a good idea. I also think it's entirely possible to bring someone in who, you know, hasn't been established within the group before. So yeah, I think that's kind of it. (laughs) 
All right. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to like come on the podcast and talk about your role and kind of how this came to be and just offer that insight from someone that has the experience of having to go into this and having the really deliberate intentionality of things and then also recognizing it's an ongoing learning process as well and speaking Mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in and listening to my podcast, Takeover for Practice with Practice. If you made it this far, thank you very much. If you'd like to talk more about our topic today and find out more info from our guests, please check out the episode description below. And if you're interested in learning about working with me, head over to practiceofthepractice.com slash apply and schedule a pre-consulting call. I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Thanks. You know, we also couldn't do this show without amazing sponsors like Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes is the best electronic health records out there. Uh, they will help you switch over from your current EHR. Uh, they also give you two months for free or uh, just money off if you use promo code Joe at checkout. Uh, they are phenomenal. They help with automated billing. Uh, it's going to make it easier to outsource your billing. So many reasons to switch to Therapy Notes. Just head on over to therapynotes.com, read about it, and at check out just use promo code joe thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain have a great day i'll talk to you soon special thanks to the band silence is sexy for that intro music and this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered it is given with the understanding that neither the host the producers the publishers or guests are rendering legal accounting clinical or other professional information if you want a professional you should find one